Welcome. We are This Week in Amateur Radio. This bulletin service is North America's premier weekly newscast from the world of amateur radio and technology. Here's the stories that are trending as we go to air this week. Language from the Amateur Radio Parity Act is inserted into the National Defense Authorization Act. The ARRL asks the FCC to protect amateur radio millimeter wave bands. The ARRL Executive Committee hears updates on the Parity Act, various FCC petitions, and small satellites. A mystery aboard the space station, as the digital amateur television signal is not being seen on the ground. Norway introduces two-by-one contest call signs. The third public test of FT-8 de-expedition mode is deemed a success, despite poor propagation. An amateur radio enforcement case attracts the attention of the FCC commissioner. And we will have an update on the ARRL International Grid Chase Competition. These headline stories will come to you in a moment, along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will be here to explain domain names and how DNS works. Our own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will be here with the second part of Taking Amateur Radio on the Rails. Australia's own Anno Benshop, VK6FLAB, talks about preparing to operate outdoors. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOY, will be here with another edition of Amateur Radio History Headlines. And we will have an interview conducted by Hap Holly, KC9RP, with Tom Mendlin, W5KUB, who will be live streaming 48 hours of Hamvention 2018, including the trip there. That's all straight ahead as edition number 1002 of North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio facility in rainy, damp, cold Albany, New York, I'm W2XBS. And reporting from our news bureau just outside Albany, New York, in the Geek Cave studios, I'm Rich Lawrence, KB2MOB. And reporting from our news bureau in Armory Square, downtown Syracuse, New York, I'm Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. Reporting from our news bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where spring has, fall has, summer has, and it's, then usual, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. And reporting from the western Catskills of New York State, where the pink flamingos have made a comeback to the garden, I'm Don Hewlett, K2ATJ. 30 minutes of solid amateur radio news begins now. The ARRL is praising the work of U.S. Representatives Joe Courtney, Democrat from Connecticut, Vicki Hartzler, Republican from Missouri, and Mike Rogers, Republican from Alabama, for their successful efforts in securing language in the National Defense Authorization Act, or NDAA, for fiscal year 2019 that aids in the survival and growth of amateur radio by giving radio amateurs the right to install an outdoor antenna at their residences with the approval of their homeowners associations. This language text from the proposed Amateur Radio Parity Act in Bill H.R. 555 formed the basis for the Courtney Hertzler Rogers Amendment to the NDAA. The amendment, offered by the bipartisan trio and accepted by the House Armed Services Committee by voice vote, will ensure that amateur radio operators will continue to play a vital role in disaster communication when called upon. Amateur radio has a long-standing relationship with the Department of Defense through both the Military Auxiliary Radio Service, or MARS, as well as spectrum sharing. The Armed Services Committee passed the NDAA by a 60-to-1 voice vote after a 14-hour markup that ran well into the night. The bill now awaits House floor action. The Senate will begin its markup of the NDAA during the week of May 21st. Representatives Courtney and Adam Kinzinger, Republican from Illinois, spearheaded the effort to include the Parity Act language in the NDAA. Both are co-sponsors of the Parity Act, which has passed the House by a voice vote twice in the past two years. Recognizing the long-standing relationship between amateur radio and the Department of Defense, Congressman Kinzinger, who served multiple tours in the U.S. Air Force as a fighter pilot and is still a major in the Air National Guard, 
and Courtney, who represents the House District that includes ARRL headquarters, have been champions of the legislation in Congress. The steadfast support of the amateur radio community continually demonstrated by Congressman Kinzinger and Courtney has been a godsend, said Hudson Director Mike Lysenko and to YBB. The Parity Act wouldn't be anywhere close to this stage without their strong support, and her organization is extremely grateful. Lysenko, who serves as chairman of the ARRL Board Legislative Advocacy Committee, also recognized other promoters of amateur radio, including House Energy and Commerce Committee Chairman Greg Walden, W7EQI, Republican from Oregon, Energy and Commerce Ranking Member Frank Pallone, Democrat from New Jersey, and House Armed Services Committee Chairman Mac Thornberry, Republican of Texas. We are deeply grateful for their continued understanding and support, the Senco said. ARRL will continue to press for support to enact the Amateur Radio Parity Act throughout the legislative process. Meeting on April 21st in Windsor, Connecticut, the ARRL Executive Committee, or EC, heard a status update on several regulatory matters and the Amateur Radio Parity Act from ARRL General Counsel Chris Imlay, W3KD. Imlay reported that the ARRL continues to work multiple avenues in its efforts to secure passage of the Parity Act. He said the ARRL continues to have solid support from House leadership, and most notably from Representative Adam Kinzinger, Republican from Illinois, who Imlay noted has worked tirelessly to see the Parity Act become law. The EC also discussed the FCC's recent notice of proposed rulemaking regarding the deployment of small satellites by colleges, universities, and commercial entities using experimental licenses on amateur radio spectrum. The EC was told that the International Amateur Radio Union has changed its previous policy regarding the coordination of small satellites called CubeSats and that the FCC policy is overly restrictive in some respects and insufficiently protective against commercial exploitation of amateur radio spectrum in other aspects. AMSAT has requested ARRL's input. The EC agreed that ARRL's comments should reflect our support for World Radio Communication Conference 2015, Resolution 659, and IARU policies. In addition, the ARRL will, one, support and encourage college and university amateur radio experiments, where the sponsor of the experiment is an amateur licensee and all operation is in amateur spectrum, and two, will discourage commercial or Part 5 experimental operations using amateur radio spectrum. The EC asked Imlay to file ex parte comments in support of petition for rulemaking RM-11775 relating to frequent changing of vanity call signs and to file ex parte comments on the ARRL's petition for rulemaking rm Dash 11785, noting that the Canadian government has implemented a new contiguous 5 MHz band and permitted a power level of 100 watts. The EC also requested that Imlay support a request by certain ARRL members for an STA or experimental license for higher terrestrial and EME power levels in the 76 to 81 gigahertz band to permit amateur radio experimentation. The EC asked Imlay to share with the National Telecommunications and Information Agency, or NTIA, ARRL's concern regarding an NTIA study to use 3450 to 3550 MHz for mobile wireless applications. That includes a portion of the 9mm amateur radio band. The EC also instructed Imlay to prepare and circulate for review comments regarding ARRL policy on a plan to make spectrum above 95 gigahertz more readily accessible for new innovative services and technologies. This could impact primary amateur radio allocations of 134 to 136 gigahertz and 248 to 250 gigahertz. Comments would include a request for prior coordination of experimental licenses in the millimeter wave bands with the ARRL. You're listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. In other business at the recent ARRL Executive Committee meeting, ARRL Atlantic Division Vice Director Riley Hollingsworth, K4ZDH, 
the new chair of the Amateur Auxiliary Study Working Group, reported via teleconference that he'd met with the FCC's Laura Smith concerning implementation of an updated and improved official observers program. Several attorneys have reviewed the ARRL's draft memorandum of understanding, and several commission attorneys who have reviewed the new manual for OOs will be providing feedback on the proposal. Once the FCC's comments are received and addressed, the working group will present its final report and recommendations to the EC, which will make a final recommendation to the full board. After lengthy discussion, the EC directed CEO Barry Shelley, N1VXY, to work with the Amateur Auxiliary Study Working Group and headquarters staff to update the full board and membership on the status of the Amateur Auxiliary Program and potential changes. In the interim, the ARRL field organization may resume making a limited number of OO appointments. Concerning ARRL governance, the EC discussed a wide range of options to most effectively update ARRL's Articles of Association and bylaws and to bring proposed additions or revisions to the full board for its consideration in July. The board in January adopted new Articles 15 and 16 to make the language of the Articles of Association consistent with Connecticut Nonprofit Corporation statutes but filing these with the state was postponed for additional fine-tuning. Article 15 addresses the issue of personal liability on the part of directors, vice directors, volunteer officers, and staff officers regarding breach of duty in their respective roles, provided the breach did not involve a knowing and culpable violation of law, improper personal economic gain, a lack of good faith, and conscious disregard or sustained an unexcused pattern of inattention amounting to abdication of duty. Article 16 would indemnify directors, vice directors, volunteer officers, and staff officers for any action taken or any failure to take action with conditions similar to those spelled out in Article 15. Changes to the Articles of Association would add the organization's informal name ARRL, the National Association for Amateur Radio, to Article 1 in accordance with Connecticut statutes. A proposed change to Bylaw 23 would clarify the schedule of director elections. Pursuant to action at the January board meeting, the EC reached consensus to develop a revised policy on board governance and conduct of members of the Board of Directors and Vice Directors, or its Code of Conduct, using a template from the National Council of Nonprofits and an edited version of the current conduct code. An ad hoc committee was formed to draft a proposal to be presented at the fall executive committee meeting and subsequently to the full board. ARRL will publish white papers to explain all changes to the Articles of Association, bylaws, and code of conduct in advance of the July board meeting. International Affairs Vice President Jay Bellows, K0QB, discussed several IARU issues, including worldwide harmonization of six meters. The IARU also is evaluating the potential for disruption of amateur frequencies by low-frequency remote power charging systems, as well as band planning issues related to the new FT8 protocol. ARRL Delta Division Director David Norris, K5UZ, updated the EC on the progress of the ad hoc working group that's reviewing board advisory committees. Norris expressed concern that, over the years, advisory committee chairs have neglected to provide feedback evaluations to the board on the activity and participation of their appointees. The ad hoc working group is exploring options to improve advisory committee structures and procedures. And in one final item, the executive committee approved 192 new ARRL life members. FCC Commissioner Michael O'Reilly has used the latest chapter in an amateur radio enforcement proceeding to reiterate his call that the Commission abolish its Administrative Law Judge, or ALJ, system. With more details on this late-breaking story, we go to Carla Pereira, KC1HSX at League Headquarters, who files this report. The long-standing case involves efforts by William Crowell, a W6WBJ of Diamond Spring, California, to renew his license. Late last week, the FCC denied reconsideration of Crowell's petition to have the Commission assign a new administrative law judge to his case. 
Crowell argued that the current judge, Richard Sipple, is biased against him. Attaching his own comments to a memorandum and opinion order released on April 26th, O'Reilly said he approved the commission's opinion that Crowell's appeal was justifiably denied, but he expressed concern that the judge took unnecessary actions in Crowell's case and in another unrelated proceeding. It has been 10 years since the FCC set Crowell's license renewal application for hearing and nearly as long since Crowell requested disqualification of the judge assigned to his case. Crowell's license renewal hearing centered on whether he had violated FCC Part 97 rules by intentionally interfering with and or otherwise interrupting radio communications, transmitting one-way communications, indecent language and music, and whether he is qualified to be and remain a commission licensee and have his renewal application granted. In 2016, the FCC imposed a $25,000 fine on Crowell for intentionally interfering with the transmissions of other radio amateurs and transmitting prohibited communications, including music. The penalty included an upward adjustment reflecting Mr. Crowell's decision to continue his misconduct after being warned that his actions violated the Communications Act and the Commission's rules, the FCC said at the time. Crowell's license, which expired in 2007, has not been renewed, but Crowell may continue to operate while his renewal application is pending. I'm Carla Pereira, KC1 HSX. On a larger scale, complaints about the ALJ process are not isolated incidents, but paint a picture of questionable decisions coupled with an elevated level of inefficiency, O'Reilly said. It seems to me that, too often, the Commission has led to reverse itself the decisions of the ALJ or address one ALJ decision or another. This reality only reaffirms my call to consider eliminating the ALJ process altogether, said O'Reilly. The penalty represents the full amount proposed in a December 2015 Notice of Apparent Liability for Forfeiture, or NAL, and the FCC said in an August 2nd forfeiture order is based on the full base forfeiture amount, as well as the upward adjustment reflecting Crowell's decision to continue his misconduct after being warned that his actions violated the Communications Act and the Commission's rules. Mr. Crowell does not deny he made the transmissions that prompted the NAL in this proceeding, but argues in large part that those transmissions were protected by the First Amendment of the Constitution, the forfeiture order said. We have examined Crowell's claims of bias in accordance with our precedent, a task made more difficult because Crowell provides virtually no detailed factual support or references to the record of his allegations, the FCC concluded in this month's Memorandum of Opinion and Order. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. The ARRL has asked the FCC to avoid authorizing developmental technologies in two amateur radio bands above 95 gigahertz that some radio amateurs may not be aware of. To start us out on this developing story, we go to Carla Perara, KC1HSX, at League Headquarters with the details. The ARRL commented on May 2nd in response to a Notice of Proposed Rulemaking and Order in ET Docket 18-21 released in February. The so-called Spectrum Horizons proceeding seeks to make the bands above 95 gigahertz more readily accessible for new innovative services and technologies. Amateur radio has primary allocation status in the bands 134 through 136 gigahertz and 248 through 250 gigahertz. Both bands are shared with the radio astronomy service, which is secondary. ARRL said it would oppose any proposal to permit unlicensed devices or largely unregulated experimental operations in the two primary amateur radio allocations in the range of spectrum the FCC is considering. The leak's comments noted that the secondary radio astronomy service in those two bands also requires a quiet RF environment. I'm Carla Pereira, KC1HSX. ARRL said that while it agrees that regulatory flexibility is justified in the millimeter wave bands above 95 gigahertz due to the extensive frequency reuse possibilities, the FCC ought to make two primary amateur, amateur radio satellite bands in that part of the spectrum unavailable for deployment of unlicensed Part 15 or Part 5 experimental Spectrum Horizons devices. The amateur allocations require protection against increases in the noise floor due to aggregate radio frequency devices, ARL said. 
The bands are used ubiquitously and unpredictably, typically but not always at high elevations for research and development purposes and propagation studies for terrestrial point-to-point, -point, satellite, and Earth-Moon-Earth -Earth communications experimentation. It is critical to preserve for amateur radio experimentation the current relatively quiet noise floor and the positive RF environment that now exists in those two relatively small band segments, ARRL told the FCC. In strongly urging that the FCC not permit unlicensed Part 15 in either primary amateur band under any circumstances, the League pointed out that the FCC has no data concerning increases in the noise floor from potentially large numbers of unlicensed Part 15 devices in either band. Additionally, ARRL said, there is no compelling need to include these two bands among those which might be made available for unlicensed devices and systems in this proceeding. ARRL said it would oppose the authorization of Spectrum Horizons experimental authorizations in the two primary amateur, amateur satellite allocations operating under a new subpart for Spectrum Horizons experimental radio licenses in the spectrum at issue. The ARRL went on to say that it would be difficult for such applicants to make an accurate showing of non-interference in the two amateur allocations due to the variety and itinerant nature of amateur radio allocations. If the FCC should, nonetheless, decide to permit Spectrum Horizons experimental authorization applicants to apply for 134 to 136 gigahertz and 248 to 250 gigahertz, however, ARL said applicants should have to demonstrate convincingly that no other suitable allocations are available and that they co coordinate their operations with ARRL when filing an application. The omnibus NPRM and O includes consideration of a petition for rulemaking in docket RM11795 from Missouri radio amateur James Webby, N0ECN. He asked the FCC to adopt rules to permit the operation of unlicensed devices in the 95 to 1000 gigahertz range, by and large applying the same technical rules to those unlicensed operations as currently apply in the 57 to 71 gigahertz band. Overall, the commission is on the right track in this proceeding, ARRL allowed. Opening the millimeter wave bands to expanded unlicensed operation is not unreasonable. Some, but not all, of the bands above 95 gigahertz can be removed from the Part 15 restricted band list in Section 15.205 Subpart A of the Commission's rules without significant concern, ARRL concluded. However, the amateur radio primary allocations at 134 to 136 gigahertz and 248 to 250 gigahertz, which are shared with radio astronomy, should be unavailable for either Part 15 operation or for other commercial development. The signal from the digital amateur TV station aboard the International Space Station cannot be detected on the ground. The unit indicates it's functioning, however. So far, ARISS has been at a loss to pin down the problem. A series of steps are currently being undertaken to diagnose the problem, a May 10th announcement from ARIS said. However, if an actual failure occurred, only a ground-based evaluation will fully diagnose the problem. The ARIS international team is working diligently to bring the system back to full operation as soon as practical. The ISS DATV system, known variously as HAM Video and HAM TV. ARIS said it would begin coordination of its space agency partners and sponsors to expeditiously troubleshoot the issue on board and, if necessary, troubleshoot and repair the device on the ground. The DATV transmitter has proved to be a valuable educational asset that ISS crew members have enjoyed employing over the last few years during ARISS school and group contacts. Astronauts Tim Peake, KG5BVI, Paolo Nespoli, AZ0JPA, and Thomas Pesquet, KG5FYG in particular, made routine use of the DATV system to enhance the ARIS ham radio contact experience. Ground stations in Australia and Europe have functioned to receive and distribute the amateur radio TV signal from the ISS. Ground crews are under development in the U.S. Several hams in Japan have set up ground stations that have received the DATV signal. 
Peak inaugurated formal use of the DATV system for 2016 Eris School Contacts with students at the Royal Masonic School in Rickmansworth, England, home of GB1 RSM. The DATV system, located in the Columbus module of the International Space Station, allowed students at the school to see as well as listen, as Peak, operating as GB1SS, answered their questions about life in space. The one-way DATV downlink takes place near 2.4 gigahertz, while the two-way FM audio component is maintained on 2 meters. The DATV system was first proposed more than 17 years ago. K1 SLD ground station received the DATV signal. It was commissioned during a series of tests in 2014. In response to calls from Norway's contesting community, the Norwegian Communication Authority, or NCA, recently announced that it will permit the use of 2x1 contest call signs for individual radio amateurs. With few exceptions, Norwegian 2x1 call signs have been reserved for club stations, which also may use the LN prefix in contests. The new call signs will use the LC prefix and single letter suffixes, are available to all radio amateurs with a Norwegian call sign, are issued for contest use only, and must be renewed every five years. The new call sign format was used for the first time in April during Norsk Ham Meeting 2018, Norway's biggest ham radio event. Call signs applied for by several contesters were allocated by random drawing. Norsk Radio Rally Liga, the NRRL, Norway's national ham radio organization, is administrating the call sign program. We hope the shorter call signs will improve the QSO rates and call sign readability and reduce the error rates for our contacts said Rogstein Rohr Brobakken, LB3RE, the head of NRRL's contest committee. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. On June 23rd and 24th, Amateur Radio will celebrate Field Day 2018. This is Ham Radio's open house, featuring demonstrations of the science, skills, and service that is amateur radio. Hams from across North America will hold local field day events to display the array of equipment and technologies they use for public service and community outreach. For more info, visit ARRL.org slash field dash day. Visitors wanting up-to-date information while traveling to or attending Hamvention are encouraged to take advantage of text alerts made available this year. The alerts will share important weather, traffic, parking, and other information throughout the weekend of the show. To subscribe to the system, users should text HAMVENTION18 to 888-777. HAMVENTION has credited Greene County Sheriff Gene Fisher, KX8GCS, with making the alert system possible. The alert system is the latest addition to HAMVENTION's efforts to disseminate important visitor information. For many years, HAMVENTION has had a talk-in station on the Dayton Amateur Radio Association repeater at 146.94 MHz, 123.0 PL tone to give directions and other assistance. A traffic bulletin board station has been added on the 145.525 MHz frequency to periodically repeat needed information. The text alerts and the talk-in and traffic bulletin stations will all share information about road conditions, accidents and other incidents, detours, parking status and other news and information. Hamvention General Chairman Ron Kramer, KD8ENJ, has said that all three efforts should help make arrival and parking more efficient. Talking station operators can also provide directions to anyone who might have missed a turn or otherwise need assistance. During Hamvention this year, hourly prize winners will be posted on Twitter as soon as possible, as well as displayed on monitors throughout the fairgrounds. Following Sunday's grand prize drawings, winners will be posted on Twitter and on the Hamvention website's prizes page. At its most recent meeting, the ARRL Executive Committee directed the ARRL Headquarters staff to resume accepting a limited number of appointments to the Official Observer or OO program as necessary and where needed under the current rules and standards. In 2015, following the FCC's decision to reduce the number of its field offices and field agents, the Executive Committee of the ARRL's Board of Directors authorized a review of the OO program. At that time, the FCC had approached the ARRL about revamping its OO program to create a more efficient, highly trained group that could assist the FCC in its efforts. Anticipating a much quicker resolution, the working group for this project decided to suspend new appointments of OOs and OO coordinators until the new program, with its expected new requirements and regulations, was put in place. 
The group did not anticipate the length of time it would take to bring the proposal through the approval and implementation process. It should be noted that even during the time period when new appointments have not been made, the more than 700 existing OOs remain on the job and the OO program remains in effect. During this extended period, concerns have been raised from the ARRL field organization about existing vacancies in the OO program. As a response, the executive committee feels that a limited number of appointments should be allowed at this time. Even with this action, any new OO appointments are being made with the understanding that a new program is coming with new requirements and new standards for OOs. For more than 90 years, the ARRL Official Observer Program has aided thousands of amateurs in maintaining their transmitting equipment and keeping their operating procedures in compliance with FCC regulations. The OO program, as part of the Amateur Auxiliary, has been working directly with the FCC's Enforcement Bureau since the mid-1980s. High standards of operation benefit the entire amateur radio community, and everyone's continued cooperation is appreciated. The third public test of FT-8D Expedition Mode, held on May 5th, is being called a success. The goal of the exercise was to simulate a rare de-expedition pileup on FT-8 by having many stations, referred to as hounds, calling and trying to work a designated pseudo de-expedition station called the Fox. A number of participants and would-be participants reported that propagation was spotty at best, said Joe Taylor, K1JT, on behalf of the WSJT Development Group, which is sponsoring the test. Nevertheless, at AA7A, G4WJS, K1JT, and K9AN, we copied 405 unique call signs of stations acting as the hounds, and at least one fox was worked by 305 of them. Many hounds worked two or three of the foxes. We're sorry if we missed you, or if propagation was unfavorable. Taylor said a shift from the announced operating frequency to 14.115 MHz was necessary before the test got underway to avoid RTTY contest activity. Soon after the 1400 UTC, they learned that W1KH7Z had some unexpected setup problems and was unable to continue. As a result, consequently, W7KH7Z took over as the Fox at 1425 UTC and continued operating until 1600. K1JT was the fox between 1600 and 1700, and G4WJS stepped in for a short bonus run between 1710 and 1750. In simple terms, FT8 de expedition mode permits a de expedition station or fox to work several stations at a time, utilizing different slots for each contact. The downside is the greater the number of parallel slots, the less power for each slot. Taylor said the penalty was 14 dB for five slots. The WSJT Development Group plotted the equivalent hourly contact rate at each five-minute interview. The measured rate success range from 8 to 33 per five-minute interval are between 96 and 396 contacts per hour. Several factors acted to suppress the rate at various times. Taylor said the W7KH7Z started to run out of available hounds after about one hour of operation, and by the 90-minute mark, the operator had worked 83% of those copied at least once. The test run has shown that the peak QSO rates with the FT-8 de-expedition mode can approach 400 per hour, and that sustained rates well above 200 per hour will be readily achieved in good condition. He said the test also helped the team identify relatively few minor flaws in the software bugs and it needed to be fixed. For example, one bug prevented hounds from using compound call signs, such as S5 slash N1YU, from working the fox. Unknowingly, the foxes wasted a significant time trying to work these stations, thereby suppressing their QSO rates. Problems aside, Taylor said the development team considers the third test run very successful and that the team hopes to release the general availability version 1.9.0 before the end of May. Hearty thanks to everyone who participated in the third public test of FT-8 de-expedition model, Taylor said. The ARRL Foundation has announced a new scholarship. The Joel R. Miller W7PDX and Martha C. Miller STEM Scholarship. The ARRL Foundation will administer the scholarship endowed through the generosity of Joel R. Miller W7PDX and Martha C. Miller of Portland, Oregon. 
The scholarship is intended to provide funding toward the educational expenses of an amateur radio licensee residing in the ARRL Northwestern Division, which includes Alaska, Idaho, Montana, Oregon, or Washington State, who are pursuing higher education. Applicants must be U.S. citizens, but without regard to gender, race, national origin, or handicap status, and be pursuing an associate's or higher degree in the fields of science, technology, engineering, or mathematics at an accredited institution of higher education. Applicants must have a 3.0 GPA or higher at a high school or an accredited institution of higher education for the academic year immediately prior to the application period. The ARRL Foundation Scholarship Committee will submit its choice of nominee to the ARRL Foundation Board of Directors to approve by majority vote. The scholarship will be endowed with an initial gift of $25,000 with earnings funding the annual award of $1,000 annually. The first scholarship will be awarded in 2019. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air, available online at www.twiar.net. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California, This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. Oh, now it's time for me to talk. I was under my desk. Excuse me. <laughs> when you're a tech guy, hello everybody, Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. When you're a tech guy... Uh, you often go under your desk, right? Am I am I ringing a bell? You know, you reach under there because there's wiring and stuff, and I had a new wireless charger I needed to plug in, and that meant a trip down below. And it's funny because uh, my, whenever I go underneath this desk, my engineers come running in. It, that, it's, no, they, it's not that they think I had a heart attack or something and have fallen, but because... <laughs> Because they don't like seeing me go down there because they know danger, Will Robinson. I might do something and break things. I didn't. Everything's fine. Charger's working. If you're the type of person that spends a little bit of time cr clambering beneath your desk, this is the show for you. Domain names. It's a phone book. Because uh, when a computer goes out on the internet, it doesn't actually need a domain name it needs something called an ip address an internet protocol address you've seen them they're the the four numbers separated by periods we call it a dotted quad you know like 10.1.10.1 or 192.190.168.2.1 you've seen those right well when you when if you go to a, a site you're not really going to yahoo.com or twitter.com you're going to a number and, and and in order for the computer to, to and the router to find that number, it, it starts, you give it a name, it does a lookup. It's like it looks it up in a phone book, in effect. Same way you'd look up, you know, Leo Laporte in the phone book and you'd find the phone number. And just like a phone number, every internet address has to be unique. So that when you, once you get that address, you that's the computer you're going to. That's the one. That's it. There's no one else using that number. So somebody has to manage this phone book. And in the early days, it was just this guy, John Postel, at the University of Southern California. <laughs> you know, I, I I imagine him in a, just a little office with a big chalkboard on the wall, and he would just say, oh, yeah, okay, you want, uh, you want Leo.com. All right, let me just write that down, put it in a book, and that'd be, and uh, here's your number. It's, uh, <laughs> and that'd be that. And then there was this, there's a system called DNS. That's the lookup system, domain name system. That's the lookup system in the phone book. And it's all, of course, automated nowadays. But you give it the name and it looks up the number. And the, the DNS is actually a fascinating, complicated service that runs surprisingly well, given that it's pretty much held together with chewing gum and bubble wrap. The domain, the, there are uh, domain name servers, the, what they call the canonical domain name servers and there's really uh only 13 of those all over the world they're the the big the big phone books and then there are people who run domain name servers all over the world your isp your internet service provider is one of them they have their dns server generally that's the one you use and 
if you, for instance, enter in a brand new domain name that no one's ever entered in before, you'll type it in your computer. will say, oh, I don't know where that is. I don't have it in my in my memory. Let me go uh, ask the do the Internet service provider. Hey, do you know where com is? And the Internet service provider say, let me look it up. Nope, not my phone book. And then it goes upstream. It goes to ultimately to those 13 servers and one of them will know and then say back and then the internet service provider will say oh thanks now i know from now on frabjustekalukale.com is uh, 196.143.1.2 and i'll keep that in my phone book and next time somebody asks i won't bother you so that's kind of how it works it trickles down from those canonical servers at the top when you uh when you want a domain name, you go to a registrar. This is a company that I can remember the, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. That's the successor to John Postel's little informal service that he ran. Uh, I can, uh, which runs those big you know, canonical name servers, then tell allows other companies, franchisees in effect, to sell domain names. When you buy a domain name from a registrar, the registrar keeps track of it, but then has to send that record up to ICANN so ICANN can put it in the phone book. And then over a period, sometimes of hours, sometimes longer, uh, it will trickle down through the system. And when you first, you probably had this experience if you ever had your own domain name, when you first set it up, no, it can't, people don't recognize it until it's all trickled down through all the servers and then, then everybody can get to it. That's how it works. ICANN is the company that decides what the dot XYZs can be. You know, they started with dot com, dot net, dot gov, dot mil, and they've added many more since then. They, they determine that. Registrars uh, can sell, you know, those names. They set the price. That's why it's worth shopping around. And they, frankly, they set the service standards. Some are better than others. Hover, H O V E R dot com. They don't, they seem to play fewer games than anybody else. It's not a, it's not a, great business to be a domain registrar. Typically, you're charging $10 a year. Some portion of that goes to ICANN. So that means you make a few bucks a year per name. You can either make it up in volume or, as mo most often they do, upsell people. Try to try to get more money by selling them other services. And that's why some of these companies, you'll it'll take you five pages of clicking no to get to your domain name. <laughs> Uh, just because they want to sell you a bunch of other stuff, upsell you hosting services, email services, domain privacy services, and on and on and on. Because uh, there's just not a lot of money in this business, frankly. And maybe because there's not a lot of money, it also attracts uh, scammers and, and people who play games trying to make more money out of it. So it is, uh, it, it, you, I, they're not, they don't seem to be all that well regulated. If you have a problem, you can go to ICANN. Um, but ICANN isn't very well funded and, is, is, as I said, is extra governmental now. So nobody's really paying attention. And, uh, you know, while the people who run the ICANN board are very good, serious computer scientists, you know, it, it's given the importance of the Internet, it isn't exactly uh, <laughs> it's not exactly IBM. So uh, somebody else mentioned Google now offers domains, uh, and I think domains.google is the Google domain uh, registrar. You know what? I, I would bet that Google does a good job with that. They're, they have other ways of making money. They charge $12 a year for domains, and I would bet they don't do a lot of upselling and so forth. So ho Hover's the one I am registered with. Uh, I used Dotster for a long time. They were very good. GoDaddy I've never been very fond of, mostly because I just didn't like their sexist ads and the guy who used to run it was kind of a creep that's changed so i think godaddy's probably fine but um hey, google domains domains.google not every registrar can register every domain by the way uh so if you if you want dot ninja you've got to go to a company that uh sells dot ninja it's a legitimate domain but uh it's not necessarily available from from every seller some of the most popular domains, like .ly, are owned by uh, company, uh, countries. .ly is Libya. So the country Libya makes a little money on the side selling .ly domain names. .tv is the small island nation of Tuvalu. <laughs> so if you want .tv, you've got to go to the Tuvalu registrar and get it from them. Uh, yeah, you can't get Leo.ninja <laughs> from everybody. <laughs> 
uh, it's a complicated system. It doesn't work all that well. But can't let it lapse because at that point, it's like a post office box. You only own that address until you you know, stop paying for it. At that point, they can do anything they want with it. And often what they do ends up costing you money. So keep your keep your bills paid when it comes to your domains. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives here on This Week in Amateur Radio. You're listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. I'm Steve Ford, WB8IMY, and this is the propagation forecast for Friday, May 11th. We may see some improved conditions on the HF bands over the next several days. There's a single sunspot at the moment, and it's pretty weak, but it's strong enough to give the solar flux index a bit of a boost. In addition, we're finally making our exit from a stream of solar particles, so the odds of geomagnetic storms over the next few days are pretty low. So, if you're operating in the Volta Ridi contest or the Arkansas QSO party this weekend, don't be surprised if you make some long-distance contacts on bands above 20 meters. On VHF and UHF, the sporadic E season is in full swing on 6 meters. FT8 operators are reporting band openings almost every day so far this month. If you want to give it a try, the FT8 frequency on 6 meters is 50.313 MHz. Above 6 meters, there have been reports of some big tropospheric band openings along the east coast from Maine all the way to Virginia, and most of these are taking place on 2 meters. This is Bill Continelli, W2XOY, with Amateur Radio History Headlines. 1987. Novices and technicians get 10-meter sideband privileges from 28.3 to 28.5 megahertz. Novices also get phone operations on portions of the 220 and 1296 megahertz amateur bands. The Element 3 written exam is broken into two segments, Element 3A for technicians and Element 3B for generals. Technicians who pass their exam prior to March of 1987 can get permanent credit towards the general written exam. 1989. Amid growing calls for a code-free license, the ARRL comes out in favor of one. The ARRL's version, however, does not include voice privileges on two meters. 1990 through 1991. Mars operations increase as amateurs become involved in Operation Desert Shield and Desert Storm. As the war in Kuwait increases, tens of thousands of Americans discover shortwave radio to get the latest news. This has been Amateur Radio History Headlines with Bill Continelli, W2XOY, for this week in Amateur Radio. Historic U.S. Navy call sign NSS will be reactivated during the 100th anniversary of the former Naval Radio Station in Annapolis, Maryland. Members of the U.S. Naval Academy Radio Club, W3ADO, and the Potomac Valley Radio Club, W3GRF, will return the historic call sign to the air during the Armed Forces Day Crossband Military Amateur Radio Communications Test this coming weekend. NSS operations from the site of the former Naval Radio Station on Greenbury Point will run from 1300 UTC on Saturday, May 12th to 0200 UTC on Sunday, May 13th. Transmissions on CW and SSB will take place on 4038.5, 5330.5, 75.5, 14487 and 17545 kilohertz. NSS will listen for callers on announced frequencies in adjacent amateur radio bands. Commemorative QSLs will be sent for all contacts. The state of Nevada has once again publicly recognized the value of her amateur radio operators in the form of a governor's proclamation issued on April 30th by Governor Brian Sandoval naming June 2018 as Amateur Radio Month in Nevada. Public acclamations praising the service of ham radio's operators in the Silver State are not uncommon. A similar proclamation had been issued by Governor Sandoval during each of his eight years in office. The annual recognition of amateur radio dates back to several administrations preceding Governor Sandoval. 
In addition to accolades bestowed by the state, Nevada hams frequently receive proclamations, declarations, and decrees from mayors, county commissioners, and the private sector. Commenting on the newly issued document, ARRL Nevada Section Manager John Bigley and 7UR said, The proclaiming of June as Amateur Radio Month in Nevada resonates the appreciation which our state's leaders and citizens have for the ham radio community, and it certainly reflects upon the confidence they have in our ability and commitment to service. Bigley elaborated about the relationship that Nevada has with amateur radio. On the state level, the Nevada Division of Emergency Management and the ARRL Nevada section maintain a formal relationship. The DEM recognizes the ARRL field organization as being an important resource. Closer to home, if you walk into the Situation Room at pretty much any county emergency operations center around the state, you are going to see the vest of their local Aries Racy's emergency coordinator slung over the back of a chair. The presence of those vests are a testament to the trust that Nevada's professional emergency managers have in our ARRL volunteers. And now with this week's satellite update, here's Bruce Page, KK5DO. AMSAT has just announced this year's venue for the 36th annual AMSAT Space Symposium and General Meeting. It will be held November 2nd through the 4th in Huntsville, Alabama at the U.S. Space and Rocket Center. Hotel accommodations will be next door at the Marriott at the Space and Rocket Center. We will have at the symposium many amateur satellite presentations, operating techniques, news, and plans from the amateur satellite world. The AMSAT Board of Directors meeting takes place on November 1st and the morning of November 2nd. There will be opportunities for you to meet the Board of Directors and the officers. This year we will once again have an auction and the Saturday evening banquet. The details on the keynote speaker will be available soon. I will bet that there will be plenty of hams operating satellites from parking lots, roofs of parking garages, and anywhere they can get a good shot at the sky. Now is the time to make your plans. I hope to see you there. Further details are available at amsat.org. Click on Events. This is Bruce Page, KK5DO. I'm Greg Stoddard, KF9MP on the rails reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. After several years of poor service by the airlines, I decided this year to start taking the train whenever possible and making it a part of the destination. But let's be honest about long-distance passenger rail service in the United States. You cannot be in a hurry or expect your train to arrive exactly on time. There are lots of reasons for the state of long-distance passenger rail service, but probably the biggest reason is we're running passenger trains on tracks designed for freight trains. Since you'll generally have spare time on board the train, why not bring along your portable electronics and have some fun along the way? That's exactly what I did on my nearly three-day adventure. Amtrak runs through some pretty remote parts of our beautiful country, which means you'll have many hours each day in areas without any cellular coverage, and that translates into no internet for you. And Amtrak generally does not offer Wi-Fi service on any trains operating west of a line from Chicago to New Orleans. In fact, the passenger cars themselves are also different west of that same line. I already had the 100 VHF rail channels programmed into my tiny Yesu HT and listened to the dispatchers and rail crews along the way. But the owners of the tracks also have voice annunciators at many mile posts operating on the same frequency as the nearest dispatch center. As the train passes by, it announces on VHF which track is in use, which freight company owns the track, and which mile post you just triggered. Those little transmitters are mounted on those red and green LED lamps along the tracks today and are usually powered by solar charged batteries. Each train has two telemetry beacons that send the train engineer data about the operating condition at both ends of each train. Despite all the RF and electrical noise, I had no problem receiving commercial FM and AM broadcasts, although my reception was reduced due to the shell of the train and the noise inside, and I could usually hear the dispatchers from 20 or more miles away with my little HT and its tiny rubber antenna. In many larger metro areas, the passenger train stations are below ground, which may also make contact by radio or cell nearly impossible. Some stations in downtown areas are surrounded by tall high-rise buildings, and at Amtrak stations there are often lots of overhead steel structures for wires and lighting, which can make good comms on any band to challenge, including cellular. 
in large cities, I had no problems making the repeaters in the downtown areas when we stopped at their passenger stations. The Amtrak station in downtown Dallas, Texas, is only one block from the spot where President Kennedy was assassinated in 1963. That train passes very close to the Book Depository building, which is now a popular museum. But the biggest concern I had using my HT on the train was the possibility of theft. On long distance passenger rail, there are basically two types of passenger cars, sleeper cars and coach cars. The sleeper cars are all divided into rooms with seats and bunks on both upper and lower floors of the train, but the doors don't have lock. When you're inside the car, you can latch your door, but when you leave the room, there's no lock on the outside. The other kind of car is a coach, which is sort of like a giant bus on the inside, but the seats are huge with enormous amounts of leg and foot space, probably more than any first class airplane seats ever have. But the entire car is wide open end to end, so using a scanner or HT would require the use of a headset or earphone of some kind. When I left my sleeper room, I slipped the HT under the pillow and I kept the curtains closed on the windows looking out into the rail car hallway because you basically can't steal anything that can't be seen. I never had any problems, but I still kept my HT quiet and concealed. A few rail employees saw the radio, but mostly ignored it, assuming I was one of those rail fans they see all the time. Although the cars are well sound insulated from the outside, there is very little insulation inside the car, so keep your volume low or always use an earphone. To sum up this episode, we learned that using an HT as a broadcast receiver does work, but not as well as your car stereo. Working repeaters by HT also works and the added height from the two-story tall rail cars helps. Although the rooms don't lock, keeping an HT inside your room or at your seat can be done safely if you keep it concealed. Always use an earphone or headset on the train. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP in Phoenix, Arizona, on the rails, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. Available as a podcast on iTunes, Google Play, and TuneIn.com. I'm Larry McGlore, KB9DIP. As we go to press, we are less than two weeks away from Ham Radio Mecca, the Dayton Hamvention, scheduled for May 18, 19, and 20. This will be Rain's 30th visit to the Hamvention, where we retrieve countless hours of forum audio for these Rain reports. That's all well and good, but it's not in real time when we bring the excerpts to you from those forums. However, there is a Ham who streams audio and video live from the Hamvention, and he begins streaming with the 10-hour sojourn he makes annually from his home to the Hamvention in his car. It's Tom Medlin. W5KUB. If you don't recognize Tom by name, when he started his Hamvention Marathon, Tom was known as Helmet Cam. We started streaming our trip to Hamvention about 18 years ago. We just came up with this wild idea. Let's put a camera on top of the helmet and we walk around. People can kind of watch it. But back then, the uh, internet was so slow. We had very inexpensive cameras, bad connections, quality wasn't very good. We kind of quit doing a helmet cam pretty quick because every time we turn our head, uh, it was making people seasick and they were getting nauseated and we never knew what the camera was pointing at anyway. Well, heck, that would have been the year 2000. And you know, back then, I mean, we streamed our entire trip and we still do today from the car and people watch us actually drive. They watch us to stop to, to eat, to get gas. We have people that stay in there with us. It's a 10 hour drive from here to Ohio. There was one year where we got pulled over doing doing uh, 89 and a 70 and uh, everybody in our chat room watching was taking up a collection to bail us out of jail that year. Where did the idea come from doing a live stream of your 10-hour car ride to the Hamvention? I don't know. I guess we were just crazy guys back then. It's amazing today. In the last few years, I watched the local news and the local weather, and now they have these cameras and they stream from their trucks. Well, we were doing it like 18 years ago before anybody else like that was doing it. So it was kind of experimental back then. I was in the technology field. I like to do a lot of things with voice over IP. Started that way and uh, that went into some of the video chat type stuff. And uh, we just decided to give us a try and see where it goes. Back then it was very simple. It was just a microphone plugged right into a laptop, no audio equipment in between. So you set the levels and, and, and that was it. And 
Of course, uh, that's one of the things that we really had to improve over the years was improve our audio quality, make the audio stable and to proper levels. And, and we went from very poor uh, video quality, 50, 60, 70 kilobits per second to stream. Today, we're running high definition video and uh, we're easily streaming uh, three, four, five megabits per second, both from on the road and at the uh, events we go to. Is the audio stereo? Yes, it is. What are you using for microphone situation to achieve that? The equipment here is fairly sophisticated now, not like it you know, was back in the beginning, but we have some high-end software that basically is like a TV control center where you can queue up videos, and particularly if the videos are, have stereo audio, of course that goes through. So we have videos, and of course we're using a, a bearing through mixer here, a 16-channel mixer. We have guests on, we bring them in through Skype, and of course we can bring them in through the internet, left and right channel like that. We try to run high def, and we try to run stereo when we can. With your Tuesday night show that you do, audio and video, you stream it on YouTube, and YouTube automatically records it. So you do have an archive of each Tuesday show. How long does YouTube maintain those shows? From what I'm understanding, YouTube maintains it forever. I don't see how they do it but with so many people streaming today. But, you know, our show uh, is called Amateur Radio Roundtable every Tuesday night at 8 Central. It's a live show. You know, it's not rehearsed or anything. We have some great co-hosts on here. Uh, Katie Allen, WY7YL from Wyoming is on here. We've got uh, Dave Kessler, KE0OG. Martin F. Jew, the founder of MFJ, has joined us uh, as a co-host on here. And also we have Riley Hollinsworth, K4ZDH. Riley is retired from the FCC. He was a special counsel for the Enforcement Division. So we even have segments on here called Ask Riley. We open the phone lines up. We also have a chat room. So people watching, they're not only talking directly to us during the show, but they can talk to each other. And we'll open the phone lines up if people would like to call in with questions or comments to a guest or co-host. Riley Hollinsworth is a class act of all the FCC folks that I've ever heard or known at the Hamvention. Riley was always well-spoken. He was prepared. Nice guy. Never came across and never does come across as a bureaucrat. Some years ago, back in the 90s, when he actually was the special counsel for the FCC, he did an update each week for therainreport.com of the latest FCC enforcement actions. Well, that was unheard of. That was just something that wasn't being done, and I was very pleased and proud to have him as part of the RAIN report. So I think you made a good choice of adding him to your uh, roster. Ron is a great guy, and uh, he really brings a lot to the show. And, you know, in talking about co-host, uh, here's one I'm re really proud of for the fifth year now. I've made friends uh, with astronaut Doug Wheelock. He's a very close friend of mine, and uh, he's joined us as co-host on our show when we go to, like, Dayton. He's uh, going to be with us again this year at Xenia, uh, signing autographs and taking pictures and being a co-host on our show. So we're uh, very happy to have him there. I've got a little short, funny story to tell you how I met Doug. I used to do a lot of satellite work and, you know, satellite communications, and that also involved the space station. So I started talking to the space station. When Doug was up there, commander of the IIS, in one month, I talked to him 30 times in one month. In fact, I talked to him three times as from the mobile as I was driving home. Well, a lot of the guys here in Memphis know guys in Kansas City, uh, satellite guys, and, and they got into argument about who has the best barbecue. We figured if I could get someone from higher up the heavens, basically, to to say what barbecue was the best, they would win the bet. My last talk with Doug while he was up there, I said, Doug, I'd like to send you some famous Memphis barbecue because I knew it was coming down. And he says, oh, man, he says, that'd be great. I've been eating out of this plastic tube for six months. So I arranged for and FedExed him famous Memphis barbecue for his first meal back when he got back uh, here to Houston. On our uh, various ham events, he joined us. He talks about that. He says, boy, I had that all over my face. So 
I was a little hesitant to send him, you know, this greasy barbecue if he hadn't eaten anything in like six months, but it went over well. So, so anyway, we won the bet because Doug uh, said, you know, our barbecue was the best. But in, in fact, I, he was here uh, last year, and I took him to the barbecue place here in Memphis where he signed a picture, and they get it up on the wall. He's right next to Elvis Presley of all the famous people on the wall in the restaurant, and he says, this barbecue is the best on earth and off earth. So I think we won the bet. Let's talk more about Amateur Radio Roundtable. How did that evolve? Our slogan is bringing ham radio to you. And we started basically, it's kind of an offshoot of our 17 years of streaming ham events like Hamvention and Huntsville, Alabama and Field Day. I know when I was 16 years old and got my novice license back 54 years ago, that I couldn't go to Dayton. I didn't even know there was a Dayton. I couldn't go because I couldn't drive up there. I didn't have the money to go. Uh, and there weren't any hams in my town to go with. I've realized over the years, there's people that are sick. They don't have the finances. They're too young to go. So we decided we're going to make this show about ham radio and let those kind of people participate as they're with us. So we did it on special ham events. We give away about $10,000 in great prizes just to viewers that are watching. But we decided that we wanted to take it a step further. So we started doing a weekly show. It has really come around really well over the years. We took our uh, webcast out to Hollywood to the stage of Last Man Standing. John Amadeo was uh, great. He invited us out and brought us out there. We webcasted from the, the stage there of Last Man Standing, a special event for three or four days. We got full reins of the studio there. We got to watch the practice, and I got to meet Tim Allen out back uh, behind the studio and asked him if I could announce on our show that he got his license. And he goes, uh, you know, I really don't want this out. And I said, it's really public knowledge, you know, in the FCC database. And he said, okay. He said, you can go ahead. So we broke the news that Tim Allen got his license. And we try to do interesting and fun things. For instance, Heard Island, the expedition down near Antarctica. Your helmet cam at the Hamvention, you're going to do that again here in 2018. It's not called a helmet cam anymore. Although, if you go to the uh, Hamvention website and you go down to the bottom, they have a link to the show. They have a picture of the helmet cam there. So they, they still call it a helmet cam. So I guess a lot of guys do. You, you know, uh, I've always been a builder and a home brewer. And I, I've been to Hamvention about 34 times, 35, maybe, maybe 36 times now. I like the outside flea market. I like to buy just military junk and get the parts out because they're so good and build things. But once we started webcasting, that started taking all of our time. It became a job and we don't buy anything. We don't sell anything now when we go to a hamvention. We work hard. It takes about four or five of us that are at the show to keep this video running. And we've got probably six or eight or 10 admins that don't go, but are also logged on helping us to keep the chat rooms neat and straight. You know, the best thing is just getting feedback from our viewers. I got a note just yesterday, a guy thanked me for last year. Something happened and I think it was a medical emergency and his trip got canceled to Dayton. And he said, because of our show, he was able to watch it. And uh, he felt like uh, he was there. We'll take a camera and roam around in all the different buildings and booths and outside and, and bring it video. We have a in-house developed program called Hambot that actually will select random names out of the people that are watching. And if we call your name, you might win an antenna analyzer or a mobile rig. It's uh, really fun to be able to give those kind of things away and also get direct input from our uh, viewers, you know, through our chat room. Just a natural platform for us we evolved into from the early days. We kind of looked like those first pictures of the moon landing, how blurry they were and everything. That's kind of how we used to look. But, you know, as I mentioned, we're running, you know, HD uh, quality uh, video now. It's a lot of work, whatever you do. You do a whole lot of work on editing, whereas we don't really do the editing because our show is live. It is costly. Hamvention will cost us several thousand dollars to webcast this year. We're going to do 40 plus hours of live streaming from our Hamvention event. We're calling it the Hamvention Marathon. 
in the years, uh, we've always covered that cost uh, out of pocket. You know, we've got a f- few people that have helped a little bit. But a lot of vendors that we deal with, I have solicited through them prizes to give out to our viewers. Anything from Heil mics from Bob Heil to Comet Antenna Analyzers or Yezu Handy Talkies. And those don't pass through me at all. So there's no money at all there. I get Yezu to donate a, a, a radio and somebody wins it, and I give them the name, and I have Yezu ship it directly. I like to provide this and give our viewers something to do a uh, hamvention. We drive up on Wednesday. We set up uh, Thursday. We're actually streaming all day Thursday during setup, and, of course, the show's probably Saturday and Sunday, and then we're too tired to drive home Sunday, so we'll stream home Monday. So. We're there, I think, five nights. It's a quite lengthy, expensive trip, but hey, if we didn't like doing it, we'd just stop it. I think it's great for you guys to do video, Ham Nation. That's good because video makes the world go around. I think we're both doing something that is worthwhile because you mentioned you got people out there, they can't make it. Whether they, you know, it's their sight or their health or whatever problems, and I think uh, both of us are filling a spot there where we're taking ham radio to them. I don't want to say it's the wrong way, but man, it takes a lot more equipment to get this video on. You got to buy cameras and all kinds of stuff and software that does a TV deal. And sometimes it gets overly complicated. And I wonder why I stay in it. It's a nightmare sometimes. We've had trouble right up to showtime. Something happens. The show starts at 8 and at 15 till 8, getting our guests on, everything starts going south and nothing starts working. And we're watching the clock to tick down to uh, 8 o'clock, and people are having to reboot their computers, and you wonder if you're going to make it on time. Of course, we don't have a dead start time or finish time, but still, we like to keep it on schedule. But you're an expert editor there, the way you edit these programs and produce them and put them together. We need to do more of that, but we just don't have time to do it. We're going to be live beginning May 16th, so tune in May 16th at w 5 kub com. We're going to be on the road for 10 hours. You can follow us on the road for that 10 hours, see what happens to us. Hopefully, we'll make it okay. And then, of course, May 17th is a setup day. That's Thursday. But we'll be on streaming all day Thursday. You'll see people like Hap walk by, and and we'll get him on the show, and Bob Heil and Gordon and different people just come by. So you never know who you'll see that day on Thursday, the setup day. And then it gets really busy on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, May the 18th, 19th, and 20th. We'll have all kinds of guests come by. We'll also try to bring you video from the flea market and new products. And our friend astronaut Doug Wheelock will be with us Friday afternoon and Saturday morning. We'll have fun there. We're going to give out prizes all day, about every 15 minutes, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. One of the things we're doing this year, I'm setting it up here, a remote shack. The remote shack is actually hard hardware. There's no software you load anywhere. It's, it's all hardware set up and we're just trying it out and testing it. You got to kind of learn the little ins and outs of it, but it works pretty good. You can change bands, change frequencies, change modes. You can do anything and everything pretty much you could do if you were at the radio. But it's not software, you say? This is not software. It's just a box that it connects through the telephone and you can connect it to Skype for audio. You can bring audio into your shack using a Skype connection or or you can just use your smartphone from your car or uh, out on the beach. You just dial the number, it answers. And then the touch tone pad uh, gives you all the commands to do all the things you want to do. And you can even talk and listen. No software needed. So we're going to have Remote Shack running. So we'll have a nice radio here at the house with an antenna up 90 feet in the air. But we're going to be mobile with Remote Shack. And as we stream live, We'll also be in the chat room, and people can be chatting with us, and we'll list the frequencies either there or on our Facebook group. And we hope to work a lot of people mobile as we drive to Hamvention. Our weekly show, Amateur Radio Roundtable, it's 8 o'clock central on W5KUB.com. It's on WBCQ on 5130 kilohertz shortwave station up in Monticello, Maine. And you can actually listen to that show through the Internet by going to an Internet address and it brings a little player up, so you could actually listen to the show that way. WBCQ on 5130, and also you can tune in and watch the show on W5KUB.com. 
And that concludes our conversation with Tom Medlin, W5KUB, the ham who streams the Hamvention every year from his 10-hour drive to the Dayton Hamvention and streams his Hamvention experience while there, and then brings it all back home afterwards. If you're going to attend the Hamvention May 18, 19, and 20, stop by booth 6204 and tell us where you hear these rain reports. And while you're at booth 6204, talk to Vern Jackson, WA0RCR, whose Gateway 160-meter radio newsletter has brought hours of informational ham radio programming, including the rain report, since 1979 on Saturday afternoons, evenings, and the wee small hours Sunday from Wentzville, Missouri, on 1860 kilohertz in magnificent amplitude modulation. I'm Larry McGlore, KB9DIP, bidding you a very 73. Keep on hamming. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. Foundations of Amateur Radio. Previously, I've talked about leaving your shack and setting up your station in a different location. I have my car configured as a mobile shack of sorts, that is, it's got a radio, an antenna mount, and wiring to manage the location of the speaker, the head unit, and the microphone. This weekend I'm planning to do a contest, and it's been a while since I operated my radio from my car. I've been advocating that you should do some preparation before actually going and doing your thing, so during the week, at lunchtime, I had a look around on the map and picked a spot I'd like to operate the contest from this weekend. I drove to the location and pretended to set up my station. Actually, I did set it up, tuned to the actual frequency, configured my tuner, found out that the tuning range for my antenna isn't ideal for 80 meters. Not that this was a surprise. I'm using a so-called multi-tap antenna and the tuning range is somewhat dependent on factors such as the little metal spike that sits on top and where on my car it's mounted. In these situations, I've heard other amateurs make statements that it's obvious because it's a compromise antenna. You won't actually hear me say that, since all antennas are a compromise, but then you already knew that. More surprising was the configuration of where I put the head unit in my car. In the past, I've used a modified mobile phone suction mount, but Sun and Age have conspired into making that unsuitable. So I learned that I'd have to figure something out before my contest. Another surprise was that the microphone lead, which connects to a so-called separation cable, Think Ethernet cable with RJ45 and joiners, which connects back to the radio, had a little broken Ethernet doohickey. It's called the locking latch, which means that while you can push the connector in place, it doesn't stay. I also remembered that this contest was going to be in the dark, so I went looking for my LCD headlamp, and it wasn't where I left it. So now, several days later after making my to-fix list, I actually managed to cobble together a few spare minutes and address most of my issues. The only one remaining is where to find the Allen key for an 80 meter vertical antenna that I'm also bringing, just in case. The point of all this is that normally if you'd asked me if I was ready for my contest this weekend, my immediate answer would have been, sure. I'm glad I followed the advice I've learned from the many mistakes I've made in the past by actually checking, and because I actually went on site, I also managed to check out the local HF environment which means that come contest time, I won't have a surprise that could have been managed by better preparation. No doubt there'll be more to learn, but that's for after the contest, perhaps next week. What do you do in preparation for an outing? I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima Alpha Bravo. The 2017 QST Antenna Design Competition was such a success that ARRL is doing it again this year with a special twist. The 2018 competition challenge is to design the best LF, MF, or HF antenna for limited space applications. Entrants should send their best designs for evaluation according to the competition rules. Even designs that don't win a prize might still be eligible for publication in a future issue of QST. Only one entry per person or team can be accepted. The submission deadline is September 1st, 2018, which allows plenty of time to build and test designs. ARRL is offering three cash prizes for this competition. First place is $600, second place is $250, and third place is $150. Here are the design and submission requirements. Antennas must be designed for one or more bands between 
2200 meters and 10 meters must fit within a 30 by 50 foot area and stand no taller than 30 feet at any point. Participants must submit drawings with dimensions. Hand drawings are okay. A list of materials. A description and summary of any measurements taken, including modeling and files, although modeling is not a requirement. Photographs. Discussion of observed on the air results and any comparisons with other antennas. The antennas entry category and the submitter's name, postal address, and email address. All antennas based on submitted designs must be the sole creations of the entrance and not available for sale. Winners will be chosen based on ingenuity of design, mechanical and electrical safety, expected performance, and durability. The judge's decisions are final. Entrants must be ARRL members. ARRL staffers and QST advertisers are not eligible. Mail entries to QST. Attention Antenna Design Competition. 225 Main Street, Newington, Connecticut, 06111. Participants also may email their entries, including call sign and subject line of 2018 Antenna Design Competition. Those who need to submit more than 6 megabytes of material should use separate email messages. Do not send compressed zip files, as these will be rejected. Full details will appear in the June 2018 issue of QST. The Radio Society of Great Britain, or RSGB, hosted the launch on May 8th of a new National Health Service amateur radio station, GB1 NHS, at the National Radio Center as part of the hashtag #EndPJParalysis campaign, a 70-day challenge to get 1 million hospital patients up, dressed, and moving with a goal of quicker recovery. The long-term aim is to use amateur radio to promote National Health Service initiatives that lead to patients receiving excellent care, faster recovery, and living longer, healthier lives. RSGB National Radio Center Coordinator Martin Baker, G0 GMB, was to initiate the first transmission of the call sign at 1045 UTC, and radio amateurs around the world will be able to hear and contact GB1 NHS. Guests from a number of hospitals, health trusts, and other linked organizations were on hand for the event, along with representatives of the RSGB. The RSGB is delighted to host this special occasion as part of the NHS and PJ Paralysis Initiative, RSGB Board Chair Ian Shepard, G4 EVK said. Amateur radio is a diverse and inclusive hobby that can be enjoyed by anyone and is a great way to help people be part of a community. From using a simple handheld radio at home through to taking part in outdoor orienting style activities, it can make people feel less isolated and encourage them to be more active. Paul Devon, G1 SMP, is the founder of GB1 NHS. The launch is the first of a number of projects planned for GB1 NHS, which include a Hospitals on the Air weekend. The Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency has announced that three CubeSats carrying amateur radio payloads, including one with a V-U linear transponder, were deployed from the International Space Station on May 11th around 10.30 UTC. Urazu, Costa Rica, and one KUNS-PF, Kenya, carry the beacon telemetry in the 70-centimeter amateur radio band, while UBAKUSAT, Turkey, carries the amateur radio linear transponder for SSB and CW, in addition to CW and telemetry beacons. Irazu is one new CubeSat developed by the students at the Costa Rica Institute of Technology with a telemetry beacon at 436.500 MHz. One KUNS-PF is a 3U CubeSat developed by students at the University of Nairobi with a telemetry beacon, 9.6 kilobytes, at 437.300 MHz. Ubacasat, a 3U CubeSat developed by students at the Istanbul Technical University, has a CW beacon at 437.225 and a telemetry beacon at 437.325. The linear transponder downlink is 435.200 through 435.250 MHz. The uplink is at 145.940 and 145.990 MHz. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air, available online at www.twiar.net.
An Iowa National Guard exercise in late April for the first time saw the use of a common digital mode among military, amateur radio, and military auxiliary radio system participants on the 60-meter interoperability channels. Military Standard Communications Mode MIL-STD-188-110 was pressed into service to pass digital messages during Exercise Stable Mercury. Because amateur radio operators on 60 meters are not symbol rate limited, all parties were able to use common digital mode at a higher data rate to pass traffic. For RTTY or digital operation, radio amateurs must transmit on the center frequency of 60 meter channels with a bandwidth no wider than that of a USB signal. The April 23rd and 24th communications exercise involved the deployment of guard units across numerous incident command posts to operate cooperatively with federal, state, local, and auxiliary units. The scenario for the drill was based on an actual severe weather event that occurred 20 years ago. And the April exercise used radar feeds and storm spotter reports taken from the June 29th 1998 Iowa Derecho to inform this training event. A Derecho is an extended straight-line windstorm associated with a fast-moving cluster of severe thunderstorms. Exercise planner and retired Colonel Rob Hedgepeth, KE0GSN, stated that a major training objective for Exercise Stable Mercury was to train in sending voice and digital messages among the various exercise participants via HF radio. The rationale was that introducing a common digital protocol would increase message throughput over what could be achieved using only voice modes. Mars volunteers Mitch Winkle, AB4MW, and Steve Hadjicek, N0CKH, prepared an amateur radio version of the software package that Mars members use to interoperate with military units employing the MIL-STD-188-110 serial PSK modem embedded in the ANPRC-150C HF transceiver and its associated chat software. Iowa District 1 Emergency Coordinator Paul Cowley, W0YR, led the effort for his state's ham radio community to load and configure the M110 program in time for the exercise. Northern Command Interoperability Communications Planner Mark Jensen, WA6MVT, noted that the 560-meter spot frequencies are the only designated channels where federal, military, Mars, and amateur radio operators are permitted to operate together. Amateur radio rules impose a symbol rate limit of 300 baud below 29.7 MHz, restricting the types of digital modes that may be used. No such limitation applies on the 60-meter interoperability channels, however, allowing the amateur radio community to use the higher-rate serial PSK mode that Mars and the military use. The M110 program employs a sound card mode similar to other ham radio community software and allowed 1200 baud symbol data rate for this exercise. The FCC proposed revising the Amateur Service Part 97 rules in response to the ARRL so-called symbol rate petition for rulemaking in docket RM11708, filed in late 2013. The League had asked the FCC to change the Part 97 rules to delete the symbol rate limits in Part 97.307 subpart F, replacing them with a maximum bandwidth for data emissions of 2.8 kHz on amateur frequencies below 29.7 MHz. Participating organizations in Exercise Stable Mercury included the Iowa National Guard's Joint Planning Group, Joint Operations Center, 671st Troop Command, Iowa Joint Incident Site Communications Capability, 71st Civil Support Team, Iowa Air National Guard's 132nd Wing Mobile Emergency Operations Center, and the Iowa Department of Homeland Security and Emergency Management Emergency Operations Center, among other entities. I'm Steve Ford, WB8IMY, and I'm speaking with Norm Fusaro, W3IZ, 
Radio Sport and Field Services Manager. And Norm, I wanted to catch up with you about the current state of the ARRL International Grid Chase. Where do we stand? Actually, Steve, it's got a lot of activity, you know, because remember, every QSO counts. You know, so whether you're in a contest or whether you're just chatting or whatever, anything you upload the logbook of the world qualifies for, for the grid chase. And the idea is to work as many unique grids in a 30-day period or in a monthly period, and then the score gets reset. But there is a cumulative score for the end of the year. So, uh, you know, it, it's kind of an interesting twist. I'll tell you where we got lucky, Steve. It's something we didn't plan on was this new mode ft8 um, oh yeah you know it is caught on like wildfire and part of the exchange is your grid it's it's built right into the uh, to the software and a lot of hams have really just taken to this uh, mode especially with the propagation the way it's been um this this mode has a way of uh, really cutting through um, on all bands you know, that's true six meters down to 160 so uh I tell you, I get, I'll give you a couple of numbers. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, in one month, in one month, two point three million Q shows for FT8 were uploaded. Wow. One month, two point three million. Ooh. Now, to give you something in comparison, side sideband was about uh, two point two million, and CW was about one point eight million. Now, you would say that, you know, FT8's taken over the other bands. That's what we hear. You I've know? heard that too. Yes. Well, that's really not a true statement because uh, while Sideband and CW QSOs have dropped a bit in LOTW uploads, and, uh, and also Clublog has experienced similar uh, numbers. Yes. But it has only decreased by, you know, maybe 2%, whereas the number of FT8 QSOs is out there is way more than that decrease so what this is telling us is people are on the air yeah i mean more people are on the air than ever before excellent well thank you norm and get on the air right that's it get on the air go go collect some grids <laughs> okay very good thanks take care steve this week in amateur radio is produced by community video associates incorporated a new york state nonprofit corporation if you would like to become an affiliate Submit news items, send us comments about the weekly amateur radio bulletin service, or just to support us. Please get in contact with us via our Facebook page. Just log into Facebook and search for the group This Week in Amateur Radio. You can also find us on Twitter at twitter.com slash TWIAR. For program audio, archives, and the latest amateur radio news, visit our website at TWIAR.net. This Week in Amateur Radio version 2.0 is produced and distributed under a Creative Commons non-commercial share-alike license. Now, for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jessica Bowen, KC2VWX, saying 73 until next week.